So let's begin in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I just ask, Holy Spirit of God, that you would come now, that you would hover over us, and that you would draw order out of anything chaotic in our own lives. You'd also reveal to us where it is that you wish to bring order at this time. And we humbly um, submit ourselves over to you this night. And we say, come, come, that the Father's will will be done and that his kingdom would come. And Holy Spirit, we ask you to do all of this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I'm very grateful to all of you for taking the time to come here and to, to hear me speak at this time. Uh, the theme of my, my talk is a tour through the confusing world of sexuality. And let's be honest, it does not, uh, it does not any other topic, I don't think, today that really takes up as many column inches and is actually beginning in many ways to divide the world as well. Certainly the whole issue of uh, gender and bathrooms is making the United States of America the divided states of America, probably more so than the whole Trump and Clinton uh, issue has been doing as well. But to be able to understand what uh, sexuality looks like, I think it's important to begin with that we look at what healthy uh, sexual development looks like. Basically, the Greeks had four words for love. Those four words were agape, the, looking at the eternal father's love, eternal mother's love, if you like, storge, which is a parental love. Then there's also filial love, which is sibling love or the love of our peers. And then there's also that word eros, from which we get the erotic, that word erotic from, which is that special covenant love that exists between a man and a woman in marriage. Um, the Greeks were very clear about those four loves. There was also um, a great uh, theologian and philosopher called C.S. Lewis in the 20th century who wrote a book on this topic as well. But it's interesting how we, particularly in the English language and in many Western languages, we may only have one word for love. And that's why in some way we have the confusion that we have today. For a time I lived in, uh, in the north of Canada and the temperatures will get down to minus 30, sometimes minus 40 degrees. And I came to learn that the Inuits there, uh, they have several words for snow because they've got dry snow and wet snow and thick snow and all those other words as well. Um, we only have one word for snow. We only have one word for love. And yet what happens is that that minimal vocabulary we have deeply affects the way in which we engage with love or indeed engage with snow. It's actually the, uh, anyway, there are developmental layers really to who we are as individuals. Yes, we are born male or we're born female, but there are different layers to how we end up with the sexual identity that we end up. And I'm going to break that open for us a little bit during this talk as well. And I also want to speak a little bit about the powerful effect that words and actions have on us. So, for example, if I say, I'm absolutely delighted to see all of you here, you might think, oh, it's good to be here. If I go, what are you not doing here? <laughs> you think, he's not bothered. There's a powerful way in which our words can affect each other. So without further ado, I'd like to just look at some of these cycles of development. In an ideal world, agape love, God's love, is constantly there. It's a constant throughout our lives. There's always in set a sense in which the eternal is present to us. Something bigger, greater, better, more perfect than ourselves. Clearly, uh, conception happens when conception happens, and God has designed that the child should be in the womb for nine months of a pregnancy. Now, we know it takes a sperm and an egg to be able to create, create a new life. So, therefore, parents are part and parcel of that concept, conception. Now, if for some reason dad dies around that time and is missing from that scene, ideally, another male figure should step in and ensure that that beautiful pregnant woman is carefully um, uh, protected, and she feels safe in the midst of her pregnancy. That's why I use the word parental figures, if it's not the parents themselves. That's the responsibility of that man and that woman to be there, it's their pregnancy together. There's a sense in which when one finds out that one is pregnant, there should be a sense of wantedness or excitement. Oh, we're pregnant, oh, that's fantastic, what great news. It's also important the message is somehow delivered into that child there, in utero, that the world is good and that the world is a safe place. That's why it's really important that we protect a pregnant woman to the nth degree. It also becomes a time of waiting and a time of rejoicing. Now, 
many people are saying today, and I want to break this open again a little bit later, the fact that actually the love a child receives in the womb has an enormous effect with how the child will respond to love outside of the womb as well. So if there's a real sense this child is a burden or it's not wanted, that can have a deep effect on that child for the rest of its life. This is the perfect world. Between the ages of zero and four is where storge or storge love begins to break open. We said that was the parental love, the love, if you like, of mum and dad in particular. Again, parents are important, the parent figures as well. Once the child is born, there should be a sense in which it's acknowledged to be a very precious child. Again, that it's wanted. But this time between zero and four is also a time of intuition. What we learn between zero and four, we just take for granted as being normal. So if a child is fed sandwiches and sandwiches alone between the ages of zero and four, they will assume that every child just eats sandwiches. There's no such thing as a hot meal. And you might remember, you know, as, as a kid, you know, you might be in the garden discovering things and you're crawling around going, oh, what's this brown thing? You go to touch it. Somebody goes, no, don't touch. It's dog poo. <laughs> we all learned you don't touch it. Where did we learn it? So, at some point, somebody taught us there's things you touch, don't touch the fire. Of course, you always do. Ah, you know, <laughs> you know, you say, don't touch the paint. Ooh, um, you know, you've got to wipe it somewhere. It's what we do. We, so it's a time of intuition. But this time, particularly between zero and four, is a time when we, we receive a sense of our being. Now, God's name is I am. God is. And God wants us to be as well. We have that phrase, well-being. This is a time of when we get our well-being. And when a child doesn't get well-being at this age, suddenly we end up with things like maybe ADHD or different things happening. And I'm not just saying that's the only reason for that. I'm saying is that we bring ourselves to a place where people don't have a sense of just being able to be and to be able to enjoy being who they are. When a mother is feeding her child, whether it's the bottle or the breast, the child isn't actually looking at the bottle thinking, I really love this food, or looking at the breast. The child is often looking at the mother's eyes. And it's through the gaze of the eyes with the mother that we first gain our sense that who we are is good because we are. Not because of anything we've done. I'm good because I am, because God has made me. People are rejoicing over the fact that this is, this is a child, it's here. I mean, let's be honest, what are we doing at that time? We're going, you know, and that's about it, you know. <laughs> but we're told, you're beautiful because you are. Dad's role at this time is to make sure that mom is able to give her attention to the degree she's able to and can to that child. That's why it is a crime of any society that once a mother has given birth, try and say, right, let's get you back to work. You know, let's get you out of the house, all the rest of it. The reason why often today we have many issues, or many of our young people today particularly have the issues they have, is because they don't have a deep sense of well-being. This is a time of learning about intimacy and trust. Intimacy means into me see. We learn to know each other. You know, as a child, I know my dad, I know my mum, I know I'm wanted, I know who I am is good because I am who I am. Intimacy also means intimid or untimid. It's a time of learning not to be afraid the world's an exciting place. Wow, great, something to discover, it's gonna be fantastic. And a time of trusting that whenever I go out and explore different things, mum and dad are always there for me. It's about good touch, rubber dub dub after the bath and cuddles and all the rest of it. It's about the gaze of the eyes, dad looking into his daughter's eyes or his son's eyes saying, son, I love you. My darling daughter, I love you, I'm crazy about you. It's about, the good, it's about those good words, you know, about the child knowing they're good because they are who they are. It's a time of belonging. It's a time of practicing and initiating. Remember little, little kids crawl out the room or they crawl back another way and they think you've disappeared or you play peekaboo and they think you've gone and then you're back again. It's all that time of discovering in the world that people are there for them. There's something called the Oedipus or the Electra complex. I don't know whether any of you have heard of that before. This happens around the age of 18 months to two years of age, or rather, I hope it doesn't have to happen. Because the, the reason I mention this is because we are conceived in mum. We all know that. We live in mum. We're born of mum. You put the child perhaps on the mum's belly and that child will crawl towards the breast. It just will and latch on. We've perhaps seen that as well. Um, but what happens is a little boy is not a little girl. He's not mum. There comes a point whereby even though he's sucking, like, sucking at the breast or he's having the bottle or whatever and he's with mum all the time, he hits a point where he has to realise for the first time in his life, I am different 
to mummy. And I'm like daddy, or a daddy figure, or granddad, or uncle, or whoever might be there, etc. Ideally, it's daddy. If a little boy does not individuate and separate himself from his mum and begin to understand that he's like dad, then what happens is, because there's no such thing as a chasm or an abyss in the spiritual realm, there's either death or life, if you like, he will go back and he will make his home back with mummy. Now, I'm not saying it's wrong for a little boy to want to run to mummy and find comfort. That's fine. But it is important that he recognises around that age, I am not mummy, I'm like daddy. Now, I've talked to many two-year-olds and said, you know, what do you want to do when you, what, what do you, want to be when you grow up? I'm going to marry mummy, they say. <laughs> You know, and dad goes, no son, mum's mine. Because he thinks he's got a great deal. I get my food, I get the cuddles, I get everything. Daddy, back off, get out of the bed. I want, Betty, I want the bed to me and mummy on our own. You know, and that's where dad's going to say, no son, mummy's with me. Mummy's with me. You know, you've got your bed and you're going to be your own little great man yourself. You're a little boy now, that's fine. But it's also true for a young girl. It's very important that a young girl recognises she is like mummy and, she, and, and she's the same as mummy. Oh, but there's something different to me. And if a girl does not get that, in some way she ends up with an Electra complex. And this can deeply affect the sexual identity of that small child as they grow up. Again, if you receive well in this period of life, you can have a heart that's so full by the age of four, and our educational system recognises this, is we send kids off to kindy, pre-primary and year one, and they start to explore the world around them. And this brings us towards filial love, which is around the age of five to 11 years of age. This is where siblings and peers become particularly important. You know, kids start getting best friends around that age, you know, and they start building dens together and wanting to play, and you can send them off to play, and it's what they do. This is where the imagination begins to grow. So remember, we've got intuition to begin with, what's around you, just take for granted, that's normal, that's the way it is. Then suddenly it's like, whoa, there's a world out there to be discovered, a visible world. That's why kids go, ooh, leaves, ooh, ants, and all those others. You know, they just get, they, they love discovering all these different things. Mum is still giving that deep sense of being, but suddenly that discovery almost takes on the traits and the characteristics of what dad is like. Generally, dad is the one that labours. Dad is the one that goes and does. So it's not unusual for a little boy, I don't even mind if it's a little girl, has got a plastic hammer and they're going to follow mum and dad, follow dad around and knock things and go bang, bang, bang and break something probably as well. And then dad goes, uh, no, and the little one goes, Ooh, runs back to mum and mum goes, it's okay, we love you because who you are is good because of who you are. But the child is learning that the world has such a thing as boundaries and there's such a thing as discipline. They're also learning about connecting and fusing with others of their own age. They're discovering the uniqueness of their own self and their identity, that they are actually an individual in their own right, within the family, within the school, within the community itself. And it's also an important time for same-sex peer connection. Now, if that little boy is sufficiently connected to dad and he knows who he is as a little boy, he wants to go on a journey of understanding what it means to be a little boy. So when he's at school, if all things are healthy and good, he wants to join the little boys and he's kicking a ball about, and he's getting bruised, and he's cutting his knee and they're making mud pies and they're going, oh, girls, oh, girls. And the girls are doing the same. They're kind of going, oh, boys, we don't really want to be with you, you know, kind of thing. Uh, this is in an ideal world. And what happens is they begin to be layered and layered and layered through their interaction with a sense of who they are as boys or who they are as girls. And they learn to become secure actually in their sex identity. I don't want to put the word gender there because gender means something quite different today. They become secure in the fact that they're male or that they're female. And again, they receive this between a 0% to 100%. Then we move towards high school. <laughs> Uh, I put the age 12, puberty kicks in a little bit early for some today, and maybe a bit later for others as well. But this is a time that we can't really stop happening unless you've got these new puberty hormone blockers that they're suddenly chucking at some of our kids today. But generally, the, when, when, we hit, when Eros kicks in at puberty, you know, ladies, you know, the estrogen, the progesterone, you start your menstrual cycle. And for us as guys, you know, the hair starts to sprout, your voice is going, oh, it's going over, you're not quite sure where it's going really, but it's, it's all changing, you know, and we all become a bit vulnerable and a bit spotty and the rest of it. It's that hormonal time of change. And what happens is, um, rather than things are going, er girls, er girls, the boys start thinking, well, actually, mm, er girls, but she's quite nice. Actually, she's even quite exotic. <laughs> and the same is true with the girls, you know, don't go near boys because they don't wash their hands after the toilet. But I really quite like him. <laughs> and does that gravitate, gravitate, they gravitate towards each other. It's a time where we start becoming other-focused. 
and we start becoming interested in the fact there might just be a special love out there for us as well. It's a time of reason. At primary school, often we send children away to write a story about my weekend away, or my favourite toy, or the holiday that I went on. But by the time they get to high school, there's a sense in which we're asking them deeper questions about life, or at least we should be. You know, it's not just what happened between Ophelia and Hamlet in Act 3, Scene 1. It might be, why do you think Ophelia reacted the way she did towards Hamlet in Act 3, Scene 1? It's about learning to debate, it's learning to reason, and it's to some extent we've lost this for many of our teenagers today. And it's about the invisible world, and it is particularly about the spiritual world. I remember working for one cardinal in Westminster many years ago, and I worked for several of them. And this cardinal, Cardinal Basil Hume, said, you know, the world has need of three things. Mothers, teachers, and spiritual directors. He said, mothers give being. Teachers teach about the visible world, and the spiritual directors teach about the invisible world. And he, and he completed that by saying, and only a woman can be all three, because truly she's the pinnacle of creation. There's something beautiful and honouring about woman there, particularly about mother as well. This is a time when most dads kind of cop out a little bit and say, oh, well, the, the teenagers, you can't do anything with them. It's the very time that dad's got to step in and say to his daughter, darling, where are you going tonight? Oh, I'm going out, not with a skirt that short you aren't. I want at least another six inches on the bottom of it. <laughs> or he might be saying to his son, son, son what, what, what are you looking at? What? I just saw where your eyes travelled. She's not a piece of meat. She's worthy of great dignity. You need to learn that. This is where a dad begins to steer his son towards holiness and steer his daughter towards holiness as well and recognise they're created to respect each other and that they have a dignity as well. All the time when, you know, when dad's coming down like a ton of bricks, they're all going, oh, I hope my dad, I hope my dad. Mum goes, we love you for who you are. <laughs> it's an important role that mum is that constant sort of sense of being, you know, who you are is good because of who you are. But this is a really important time of not just identity, but validation. A time of discipline and boundaries, self-survival, respect for others, especially the opposite sex, and clear boundaries. The issue is this, is you can't stop, unless you're taking these puberty blockers, you can't stop that onset of those teenage hormones happening. Um, and what happens, of course, is this, this phase affects all the other earlier phases if we haven't been loved properly. Ideally, by the age of 18, Somebody, each male, each female, should be whole enough and independent enough in their own right to actually go ahead and say, I'm ready to be married or I'm ready to decide what my lifelong commitment is going to be. Have you noticed today that we're putting off, marriage is put off longer and longer and longer, if happening at all? People, you know, aren't being accepted into key roles and, and, and major professions until they're a little bit older because people aren't mature enough as well. But years ago, people were mature enough because they were being layered in their own sexual identity in that way. And these are things that should be happening. I put 500%. I know that doesn't really exist, but I put 500%, meaning there's a really strong sense in an ideal world that you are loved in the womb. You are loved at home. You are loved in your school years, both your primary and your secondary school years, your high school years. You're in a place now where you're ready to be able to love another. Does that make sense? Okay. I'd like to tell you now a little bit of my story based on the back of what I've just shared with you there. So, I was conceived out of wedlock. There's a little sort of, there's kind of me, if you like, in my mum's uh, womb as well. Uh, I was uh, conceived with a twin sister, although my mother didn't know that she'd got, had, she was, she'd, uh, was carrying twins until she gave birth two months early. In those days when I was born, there was no such thing as ultrasound. So basically her waters broke seven months into her pregnancy and uh, she got to the hospital, gave birth to me, and then she said, they said, you got another one. And my sister came as well. As the thing is this, is that during my mother, uh, during, around that time in my mother's life, there was, an, in a sense, she was um, hurt by three men. Here's the way I put it. She'd been married at the age of 20, and the husband she'd been married to didn't treat her well at all. In fact, I'd been led to believe that he knocked her about a little bit. And so what happened is she left him, and I'm pleased to some extent she left him, because I don't think any woman should ever have a hand laid on her, ever, ever. Nevertheless, she stepped aside. In those days, you couldn't get a, a divorce online or from Coles or whatever it is you seem to be able to do with ease today around divorce. Um, so she was still officially married to him. A couple of years later, she had a three-week love affair with a student from the local university, a foreign student. And then he flew back to his country after a three-week love affair, and then she discovered she was pregnant. But it was during the time of her pregnancy that her father died. He was the breadwinner. 
And because there wasn't a welfare state as there is today at that time, she therefore knew she couldn't keep this child, which was actually two children. So literally she abandoned us at birth. She refused to look us in the eyes because she didn't want to connect with us, knowing that if she did that, she wouldn't want to give us away, but she knew that she'd have to. So basically my twin and myself were uh, conceived out of wedlock, failed by, uh, in a sense, by those three men, or my mother was certainly failed by those three men. And uh, we were left in a place of anxiety and security. And some of the messages, therefore, that we were receiving in the womb were toxic shame. Who I am is wrong. Now, remember we said earlier, you know, who you are is good because of who you are. Well, if my mother isn't there to look me in the eyes and tell me I'm good because of who I am, there must be something wrong with me, is the message that begins to go through your mind. The second message is this, men can't be trusted. Now, that particularly affects a male child within the womb, possibly more than it might a female child. The third message is the world isn't safe. That's what's happening for me as I began to enter the world. Let's go into that next stage. So I'm being born basically with these three messages already in a sense deep within my subconscious. Because we were premature and abandoned, there's a sense in which we were rejected and we felt unwanted. What does it feel like to be rejected and unwanted? Painful. <laughs> We were incubated, so there's no good touch, good gaze, all the rest of it. Hey, son, we we'll love you. It's great. We're, you know, it's going to be. You're going to be fine. Go, f you know, fight for it, little lad. Lad, fight for it, little girl. It's going to be great. There's nobody. So basically, the sense of disconnection. There's just nurses going in, nurses coming out. There's doctors going in, there's doctors going out. There's a sense in which we're a burden. Then we were fostered for a number of months, having been incubated for three months. There's no sense of permanence. Who do I really trust as parents as well around that time? So I'm being born, really, to, when by the time we get towards the age of, um, that's right, before, but by the time we hit in primary school, um, these are the messages that, that we're living with. Incidentally, my twin sister and I were adopted at the age of six months into a lovely Christian family. My parents had three of their own children, age five, three and two, then adopted us at six months of age. I think living saints in somewhere or other. So a great, great thing to happen. Something that happened to me is rather than my running towards primary school, getting ready to join all the other little boys, having made that deep connection with dad, yes, no, <laughs> not at all. If anything, I've got this distrust towards men deep within my soul. At the age of four, my parents decided it would be a good thing to send me to a girl's school with my twin sister to help her to settle in because we are literally encased in each other's personalities, which is not unusual if we'd been through all that we'd been through in those early stages of life. So my first experience of primary school was basically ballet and bunny rabbits, to say the least. Uh, I might point out as well, is a year beforehand in kindy, um, uh, one particular day, my mum addressed me in a pair of my sister's pink frilly knickers. Because, you know, trying to find clean underwear for five kids early in the morning sometimes is difficult. So just put these things on and put your shorts on, off you go. So off I went to kindy. But then at one point I was playing with the boys. And my twin sister comes up to me and she pulls my shorts down and goes, look, my brother's wearing my pink knickers. It's my earliest life memory. And I went bright red and I burst into tears and I cried and I cried and I cried. So there I am, rather than begin to joy, take my place with the boys, and rather than be able to engage them at school, I'm feeling more and more and more shamed in this particular area. At the age of eight, I'm first exposed to pornography. I don't know whether I'm exposed to porn to begin with or whether my sexual abuse begins at the age of eight, but I know that we have a cocktail that's beginning to affect my life now. Um, pornography back at the, when I was the age of eight was black and white pictures that backed up a number of different stories. Um, it's nothing like we, that's available and swilling around our society today. But the harmful effect those images had on me and particularly they were within a treehouse setting. We had a huge grounds, big garden, and, and no adults ever went up in the treehouse. And that's where I was exposed to this stuff. And it was all kind of shh, secretive and quiet. And I learned that you didn't say anything about this sexy stuff at all to anybody. It's all quiet, shh, you know, shameful kind of stuff. So I learned to keep my mouth shut about what I was seeing. And I was being shown by some of the older lads from around the, the local area. So with, in a sense, in that setting, I didn't talk about things sexy, but I was being drawn towards it. It was inappropriate, totally inappropriate for my age. Around that time, there was a Christian married teacher at my uh, local primary school, which is a Christian school. It wasn't a Catholic school, a, a Christian school. And he began to sexually abuse me. And that went on every week for three years while I was at school. 
Alongside that, one of my older brothers, older friends, having realised, I think, that I'd been eroticised, also began to take advantage of me. And by the time he, six, he hit 16 and I was 11, he dropped me like a hot cake because he got a girlfriend. He never wanted a boy, he wanted a girl. I was, in a sense, his toy before he could get himself a girlfriend. So by the time I hit the age of 11, I was feeling dirty. I felt different to everybody else. Um, I felt alone. I'd been taught arousal. I'd also been objectified. Rather than it being me being loved for being me, in a sense I was being used for what I could give to somebody else. I felt inferior because I was always the little one in these relationships. They weren't relationships at all, they were abusive. And I disclosed to my head teacher at the age of 11 what had been going on to me at that time. Within 48 hours the teacher had gone and nobody ever spoke another word to me. Nobody. I never told my parents. So that fact that nobody cared for me afterwards made me think, well, that just reminds me of the fact that really who I am is wrong. Remember the toxic shame to begin with, repeating those messages. My best friend, who's the first person I shared with about my abuse, incidentally, once the teacher, um, uh, incidents happened around the teacher at school, uh, my best friend changed years as well. I felt wholly and utterly abandoned. And that repeated again, the messaging from my earliest stage of life. So this is me as a teenage lad moving towards a time of Eros. By the time I was 14, I was addicted to pornography and all my craving needs for love, to connect to my own kind, to demystify men, you know, to try and be linked in with dad, with mum and all these different things. My whole world was just, just swimming around in eroticization, as you can imagine. At the age of 14, I called the lesbian and gay switchboard and um, I'm pleased they were there to call. I didn't feel I could go to anybody at school. I didn't feel I could go to anybody at church. And I was still practicing, you know, my family practicing Christians at that time. And so, but what happens is they said to me, it's fine, you'll find a nice boyfriend, you'll settle down, all will be well. Well, I'm pleased that they gave me a sense that all would be well. Now, that wasn't all true, because all wasn't well later on. But at least they were there to listen to me. And I think there's a big message for our society as a whole today. That's why I'm really keen that there are places where people can go to and say, this is what I'm feeling because our feelings are our feelings. They're not right or wrong, they're just our feelings, but we have to be able to acknowledge where we are, particularly if God is to meet us there, where we are as well. By the time I was 16, I was alcohol dependent. You wouldn't really know it. I was drinking more very, very late at night. And I ended up being raped by three different men at the age of 16, 17, and 18. That left me very, very, very confused. It took me many years as an adult to actually accept that that was rape. I wouldn't normally use that word, it took me a long time because I realised I said no to them, but, but really my boundaries were gone. I just thought, well, this is what people do to me, so let them get on with it in some way or other. 17, I came out to my parents as gay. I came out in high school as well as being gay, and everybody patted me on the back and said, well, well done, but we all know you're gay. <laughs> We've known it for years. I was camp. Um, I had a, a, my voice was much higher, and I had what's called a, a mincing walk. You know how some guys, you know, some guys who sort of walk like that, etc. That was me. That's who I was. You know, I was very, very, very effeminate. I'd been given all the female roles throughout my schooling years and all the school plays, etc. And by this point, I'd begun messing around with my twin sister's makeup, foundation and eyeliner, and those type of things. So at the age of 18, I went down to London. I became very involved in uh, fighting for gay rights. I was the first person at my university in London to come out. Today, there's got this equity diversity divisions with thousands and thousands of dollars. You know, in my day, it was me. <laughs> um, and I saw it as my responsibility to then to set up um, a lesbian and gay group in university, which I went and set about doing as well. So I was in a very, very different place to where I am today. I was saying to people that um, the people are born gay. This is my gay gospel, if you like. My good news was is I've discovered this and this is fine and this is where we are. So by the time I was 18 and going to London, that left hand side there, all those different messages are the messages that I have about myself that deep down I'm wrong, men can't be trusted, the world's not safe, I'm unwanted, in pain, nothing's permanent, I can't trust, I'm a burden, I can't connect, I'm dirty, different, alone, things are secretive, you're quiet about your secrets, you don't tell them to anybody, I've got a perverted view of the world, I feel inferior, aroused, objectified, abandoned, confused, and I'm now layering all of this and saying I'm gay. And yet I'm questioning also whether or not deep down I really am a woman in a man's body, because my attraction is solely and utterly towards men. And in those days, I thought, well, that makes sense, you know, maybe I'm just a heterosexual woman in the wrong body. 
Maybe that's what it is, but we weren't talking transgender in those days. So my journey of life, just a real, just a quick view for you there, just on the screen, is just to see what I should have received on the right-hand side. And on the left-hand side was just the fact that actually I was malfunctioning all the way. Now, I was being raised in a strong Christian home, and I was praying to God all along in this. I was a scholar at high school as well. And so nobody really knew what was going on, apart from the fact that I was this kind of camp, a bit kind of in your face kind of guy. And yes, I've really calmed down. I know it's hard to believe. So a bit more of my story. I hit London. I became promiscuous. They always said, you know, um, uh, no pecs, no sex in some way in the gay scene. Um, but I was praying at the same time as well. And I ended up meeting a guy called Steve. And Steve ticked all my boxes. Steve had been a soldier in the Falklands War and, you know, he's kind of this sort of macho type of guy and the rest of it. And I'm like, oh, hi. And he's like, oh, hi, kind of thing, you know. And, and together we, we became a partnership. And my family was very accepting of Steve. And uh, we ended up in a long-term relationship with one another. We were totally and utterly committed to one another, myself and Steve. Um, but what happened while I was there with Steve is that um, I was invited at one point by a, a Catholic friend of mine at university to go along to a gathering of young adults. It was something called a Life in the Spirit seminar. I'd never heard of anything like this. Um, but deep inside, as you can tell, because I had a love deficit throughout my childhood in some way, the love was coming my way. I just built a brick wall towards anything that came my way. I received all the rubbish stuff and I couldn't believe I was worthy of the good stuff. So my love deficit was huge. And he talked to me about the fact that Jesus wanted to love me and love me more. I'm like, look, mate, there's more love. I'll take it, you know? I was going to take it in any way whatsoever. So I went along to this gathering of young people. And when I went in there, suddenly the, there was this vibrancy of, and, and I just thought, these guys know Jesus. I know all about him, you know, but I don't know him like these guys seem to know him. And I was led to a place of making a prayer of repentance, of saying, Jesus, if there's anything that stands in the way of your love from coming to my life, then I'm saying I'm sorry, I repent, if you like, that's the prayer we say, I repent of that, I'm sorry for anything, and I ask you to come and to meet me. And I prayed that his Holy Spirit, the all-wise counsellor, would come and meet me. I felt nothing. <laughs> I thought, oh, oh well, I gave it a go. A few days later, this mate of mine said, how is it for you on Friday? I said, oh yeah, okay, not bad, nice night. You know, I, did you say the prayer? I said, yeah. Did you ask the Holy Spirit to come? Yeah. He said, now you've got to believe, you've got to step out in faith. And I've learned faith is spelt R-I-S-K. It's a risk. I learned to pray. I learned to try and be, to try and be. I had no sense of well-being. I couldn't be. I'm like, blah, 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 all the time. I learned to be for two minutes in prayer and go, that's over, and walk off. I learned to do that every day for a week. Week number two, I learned to do it for three minutes to the point where by week number six, I got it down to about eight or 10 minutes where I was learning to be still. Now, Steve said to me, I'm at university Monday to Thursday, I'm with Steve in his apartment, th um, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And I'm going to this Catholic gathering on a Friday night on my own where my mates are going. Steve says to me some weeks later, there's something different about you. Is it that Friday night thing you're going to? I said, yes, I think it is. He said, can I come along as well? I said, yeah, you come along. He too got deeply touched by Jesus, deeply touched. He was a lapsed Catholic. I was warned to be careful of the Catholics, you know what I mean? Because I was, wasn't raised Catholic. Um, but I went along with Steve as well. We went, started going to Mass and we're going along to this gathering as well. He got deeply touched, so we began to read our Bibles. We began to take our Bibles to Mass. How many Catholics take their Bibles to Mass? This gay couple are taking their Bibles to Mass and talking about the Word of God and everything. And we're growing, and we're going to these dinner parties in London. We're becoming the archetypal gay couple, committed to each other. And people are saying, oh, aren't they a lovely couple? And we're saying, God has made us this way. But I'm praying more than Steve is, because I'm praying at university as well as when I'm with him. He's kind of praying more just when I'm with him. And I hit a point some months later where I sensed the Lord is asking me. I wouldn't have said it was the Lord, really. I just felt uncomfortable with what's going on in the bedroom. And I drew a line and said, Steve, I'd like us to go back. Well, I'd like us to wear pajamas. And I say that to you very deliberately, because actually this is the first time in my life since being a small child around the age of eight, I'm drawing a line between myself and any form of sexual activity or sexual exposure. Can you hear that? I'm saying, I want to clothe my own body. I'm almost saying I want to respect my body for the first time because I've begun to pray. Steve's a bit like, mm, well, okay. Within a number of weeks and months, I've hit a point where I am deeply, deeply uncomfortable in this perfect gay relationship. 
we'd been discussing whether or not we should go and get some form of blessing in, in, in the Netherlands or in Denmark or Sweden, one of these progressive countries, because we're so committed to each other and we're committed to Christ. But in the midst of this depth of this prayer life, I begin to feel more and more uncomfortable to the point where I said, Steve, I have to finish this relationship. I finished it, and I'll be honest with you, I had a Catholic priest and an Anglican priest both say to me, you're mad, go back to him. He's the best thing you'll ever have. And they were right, he's the best thing I did ever have, because he's the person I'd learned to commit myself to, and I'd never really been committed to anybody, really, before. So I'm not saying that God wasn't working in this, but was it the best thing that God had planned for me? No way. God was asked me to, to get Steve to step aside from that. So what happened is I found myself stepping aside from Steve and stepping aside from the gay community. I was still wholly same-sex attracted, but I stripped off that word gay from my identity and said, I'm James. Well, I'm same-sex attracted, whatever it is, I'm James who belongs to the person of Jesus Christ. And now this is the journey that I'm going to walk. And I began to walk that journey. And my prayer became, as I prayed earlier, come Holy Spirit. I learned rather than celebrating gay pride, I started celebrating Christian humility and surrender to the cross, possession by the Holy Spirit, not the spirit of this world. And I began to see that actually the cross was there to take on all my shame. And let's be honest, I had a lot of shame. I had some hard decisions and some great challenges to make and some huge choices, but I began a journey of inside of beginning to be restored. Now, it took me to be about the age of 24, 25, when I had a realization in my prayer it's in that quietness of learning to be still. By this point, I've got it down to about an hour a day where I'm learning to be still before the Lord. I'm inviting the Spirit of God to come and search all of me because he says he's, he knows me, he searches me the whole lot. And I begin to have images and a sense that the, something had happened in the past. It was only in my 20s that I began to realize that I had been sexually abused as a child. Now, that went on for three years. And you may say, well, how can you have forgotten it for so long? Because how would you deal with trauma? If it's so traumatic, you push it down. But the Spirit of God came back and searched me and began to bring all this stuff up. And I know today that that did take place because I've been back and I've found my abusers. And um, the teacher, the, the case went to court in the UK and uh, we have a guilty verdict in the British legal system through that. So the Spirit of God knew what he was trying to teach me in the midst of all this. But I had to go through a time of deep inner healing as well. I've just mentioned there's two people I, mentioned, uh, I went to see, my, my two abusers. I also went, felt the Lord was saying to me, go and find your birth parents and look them in the eyes. Have that sense of connection with the very place that you came from. I found my birth mother and then um, some years later I flew to the ancient city of Aleppo that I think many of you now have heard of but people hadn't. And I went and I met with my Syrian father and I'm the oldest of his ten children. So I have eight half Muslim brothers and sisters as well. As if my life wasn't already complicated enough, but there we are. The last person I went to see was Steve. Well, he wasn't the last person, but the fifth person I had to go and see was Steve. It had been some years since I'd been with Steve, and I stepped aside from the gay community. And what happened is, as I began to find myself being more and more restored, and all those red sentences you saw written there on, this, on the screen earlier, I began to take all of those to the cross and said, Lord, I'm wrong. And God says, no, you're not wrong. I created you and knit you together in your mother's womb. I made you right. Yes, Lord, but you know, but I, uh, you know, I'm just inferior, I'm so low, I'm nothing. He said, I've made you to be the head and not the tail. Give me that phrase, your belief that you are inferior. Oh yeah, but my life was a mistake. I should never have been born. You know, the, the, my dad's sperm, my mum's egg. He goes, hang on, you, I called your life into being. You're born of the imperishable word of God. And I learned what it was to take all of those lies and to exchange them at the cross for God's holy word of what his eternal word says about my life. And the more and more I began to do that, the more and more my inner being began to find a sense of well-being and to be restored as well. I found myself becoming a man among other men. I found the Lord was restoring to me the years that the swarming locust had eaten, as it says in Joel 2, verse 25. And I, uh, it's around that time that I began to hear things around the theology of the body, which John Paul II had been talking about in the late 70s, early 80s. And uh, one of the phrases that um, Jesus regularly, well, he used it several times, he talked about going back. He said, you need to know who you are from the beginning. And was calling me back to those first chapters of Genesis itself and saying, male and female, I created you. And I began to realize if God has created my body male, then he's created me to be a man. 
and I had to step into that truth whether I feel it or not. And I began to lay all, all my imagery and my fantasy and, and, and all the pornographic images, etc. I placed it all there at the foot of the cross. And my prayer was never heal me or anything else. My prayer was, Father, make me into the man that you created me to be. And that's still my prayer today, that I'd still be you know, becoming more and more and more the man he's made me to be. And for you ladies, that you would pray that you'd become the woman that he created you to be as well. And the prize overall is Jesus Christ himself. The prize isn't heterosexuality. The prize isn't even marriage. Um, the prize is the fact that we would know the person of Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace there, dwelling in the, in the uh, core of our hearts. And what happened for me, the more that I found resolution around the issues around where I was cut away from men, the more that I found Christian men or my brothers who would walk with me in my pain and would share vulnerably of their own pain, so it wasn't just about me, but about all of us. We're all broken. We began to walk together. And men slowly stopped being a mystery to me. And the more that I dealt with all the vows that were wrong inner vows that affected my belief system in my mind and therefore affected my behavior, the more that those inner vows that were the wrong tuning or the twisted tuning, if you like, the more they were attuned to God's way is the more that my belief system changed and my behavior began to change. To the point that having forgiven those three men who my mother felt abandoned by in the womb, if that's where I picked up distrust, I remember saying one day to the Lord, Lord, if I took on mistrust of men in the womb, then I'm saying now as a grown man, I repent on behalf of my little self in the womb. I repent of that vow. And I break the, the power of that vow over my life in Jesus' name. And I leave it at the foot of the cross. And I choose in Jesus' name to trust men. I choose it. Literally within weeks and months, my voice began to drop. And my walk began to change. And people started to notice it. I couldn't put it on. It's what it was. The more that men stopped being a mystery to me, I suddenly hit a point where I felt like, oh, I've mastered chastity, it's easy. <laughs> what it was is I was feeling asexual. What's happening is I was actually going back to a place where I was like that child, aged five to 11. And I was just able to play innocently with the other guys and recognize myself as a guy with the other guys in a way I'd never done as a kid. And then what happened is what's really scary, because nobody warned me, is I started noticing long hair and curves, and that women smell great. <laughs> and I began to find myself being attracted towards women. Nobody told me this might happen. <laughs> to the point whereby I began to date women, etc. Today I'm a dad, it's, it's just an ama amazing thing, something I was told would never happen to me. The lesbian and gay switchboard told me this would never happen, back off from all that stuff, it's never gonna happen. Deep, deep down, that actually was a lie. And today I find myself, um, in the real honourable and blessed position to be able to try and serve others um, in, in their own brokenness too. In a sense, God's taken the soul from my life um, in somewhere other. And I'm not saying I'm in the category of St. Paul, far from it, I'm too broken for that. But nevertheless, an opportunity that my brokenness should be used to be able to help other people as well. So what did that restoration journey look like? First of all, prayer, developing heart-to-heart -heart intimacy. Remember that early stage development? The second thing was good therapy, careful, prayerful, humble therapy. The AAA is the attention, the affection, and the affirmation. Remember we talked about good touch, words, and gaze earlier on? I was beginning to get that. And when I got those three, particularly from the guys, I had a really strong sense of the big A, the self-acceptance. I talked about inner vows. Deep within me, the vows had made, that affected my belief system. That affected my behavior. I realized I had to deal with all of those things. I was wooed by Jesus' voice and his presence. I began being drawn towards the Eucharist. I didn't believe in the real presence at all. But uh, I'd go with friends sometimes in their prayer time, we'd pray before the Blessed Sacrament. And I used to be thinking, I feel different this time round, and I just did. Redemptive suffering, I realized this is gonna be a painful journey. You know, if your bone has set wrong, it's best to break it to set it right. And often it, once it's set right, it's stronger than it ever was before it's broken, they say. Redemptive suffering is part of our life, so, humbly submitting before God as well. I had to take on a mother. This was amazing for me. When I, I remember the realization of, of, of Jesus saying to me, um, as, he, as he said to, um, said to John, son, behold your mother, mother, behold your son. And from that moment, the beloved John takes Mary into his home, which is into his heart and his whole life. I remember the day that I said to Mary, Mary, I think I need to take you into my heart. I accept you into my heart. 
And from then on, because I had the, the presence of the perfect woman with me, I became aware I am not woman, I'm actually man. Even though I'm pretty still, I'm still camp, I'm realizing, but I'm not like you. And the other thing is this, I was able to go to my adoptive mother and my birth mother and say, I love you and I forgive you. And I'm not going to look to you to try and be anything that I need you to be anymore, because I've got another mother who's perfect. Praise God, my mother's today got on famously well. It's quite, it's just, it's an amazing story. Trusting in the Father, a restoration of the Father through the, through the sacrament of reconciliation as I began to practice that. Through taking Joseph on as my foster father, a loving foster father, and in the lives of the saints, seeing how they trusted God as Father. And I became part of the family with a capital F. At the age of 24, I converted to Catholicism. I gave in, basically, and realized I need to make this my home. And we are what we eat, whether it's good food or fast food or whatever it is. And I find myself beginning to be nourished by the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. And I want to say this about the power of the Eucharist to heal and transform. Now, you know from the story I've just shared with you, I was raped numerous times, numerous times. You know, my body, I mean, I dissociated massively from my body. If you look carefully at my face, there's lots of scars that all from my childhood because I couldn't walk straight anywhere. I walked into doors, I fell into this because I was dissociated from my broken, raped body. But the more that I received of Jesus in the Eucharist, particularly in my mid, late twenties, is I began to weep through, from the word, from the liturgy of the word, through the Eucharistic prayer, through receiving communion to the post-communion prayer, and then my tears would dry up. This happened for about 18 months. At the end of the time, I said to the Lord, Lord, what are you doing here? And I'd always thought that I was receiving Jesus, but as St. Augustine makes it very, very clear, we don't receive Jesus. Jesus is receiving us. And he was pulling me back into his body, <laughs> back into him and restoring me. I love being a man today, and I love being in this skin after all that's happened to my body. And I feel no shame about all the things that have happened to me, which is why I can speak to you with, them with great ease, because of what Jesus has done on the cross. His naked, crucified body has taken my pain into himself. I also believe the Catholic Church is getting the biggest hammering around child sex abuse today because the world, the enemy, whatever you want to say it, knows perfectly well that the secret to people getting really well is hidden there within the life of Mother Church herself. And I've done a lot of work with many survivors over the years. And those who I've seen really come free, have come free because of practicing a sacramental life and having a deep spiritual life in learning to listen to the voice of the Spirit. Dad's words, our forever father, our eternal father, his words had a massive impact on me. One Lent, I exchanged one of my lies, for one of the words, for a, for a word from the scriptures every single day. And I'm still doing it these days, you know, all the time, trying to take thoughts captive that don't speak who I am in my true God-given identity in Jesus Christ as well. So I'm not expecting you to be able to read all of this, but I want you to see that the journey, God took me to a place, all those layers and layers and layers of stuff that happened in my life, to bring me to a point where I received of Jesus Christ. And then he began to take me onto another journey that led me to being where I am today and in moving to Western Australia. People often ask me, are people born gay? Because the, the, the message out there is, of course people are born gay, we're born gay, it's the way we are. Well, um, I'd say this, it's definitely not a choice. Nobody in their right mind chooses to be same-sex attracted. But I spent 10 years in London running a spiritual support group for men and women who are same-sex attracted or gender questioning. In London, as you can imagine, you have everybody from across the world, every age group, every type of relationship. Some people have been with their partners, their same-sex partners 30 years. Some people were saying, you know, they, they come dressed as a woman one time, as a man the next time, whatever it might be, but they were all welcome. And I'd say this, is once people began to make the mark of chastity and to cut off from the pornography, the autorization, and from identifying themselves by some sexuality or sexual label, and realizing their label, their true identity is Christ, is what happened is God would begin to be able to work deep, deep, deep in the soul and allow often a lot of the toxicity to begin to rise and to deal with that as well. And I began to see that right across the board from anybody who was willing to go on that journey. Now, look, there's, there've been 23 empirical studies, there's been more than that done now, but we were done between seven, 1970 and 2010. Uh, and basically there's a, a list of those different um, studies that were done. And at least 40% of people who went under different types of therapy were able to experience some shift away from same-sex attraction towards heterosexuality. But as I said to you earlier, heterosexuality is not the goal. And we never ever 
ever say it's the goal. So what does change look like? Many of the LGBTQI community would want to believe that if you're once gay then you're now kind of straight. I don't even like those words or that vocabulary because we're all sexual beings who are broken on our own journeys and where we need to accept each other Whatever somebody calls himself, we have to accept each other where we are, but point each other towards the cross of Jesus Christ and towards redemption and that gift of holiness that awaits us there with him. Um, so people say you're failed if you're not acting like the perfect straight person. Well, I mean, I admit quite openly, are there times when I'm same-sex attracted? Yes. Often? No, not at all. If I, I, it's not very often I think about it. But to turn around and say I'm this perfect heterosexual man, well, I don't know what that means. I'm James as a work in progress on my journey. But I know this, I'm in a place today that I never expected to be in 20 or so years ago. The right assumption is this, I have greater peace, satisfaction in life, less shame, less hiding, less depression. Isn't that a great gift <laughs> for anybody, for everybody? That's what change really looks like. So as I said, heterosexuality is never the ultimate goal, not at all. Happiness and peace and that relationship with God are in line with a person's deeply held values, beliefs and life goals. And although you may not hear stories like mine very often, there are many of us with my story, not just here in Australia, but across the world itself. There are many in Sydney with this story. There's many in Perth. There's many in Brisbane. There's many around the place. Have a little bit of a breather. How are we doing? We doing okay? So, I'd like us to ask ourselves, how did we actually get here? We've all heard the word sin. We've all heard about original sin. But I'll put this challenge to you that there's more than just original sin. Or rather, original sin begins to affect different people's lives and begins to affect the clumps of people, social perspectives as well. So really, from original sin, we're also dealing with ancestral sin and cultural sin. There's a great book by uh, a Catholic professor called uh, Budievsky uh, from the United States. It's called What We Can't Not Know. What an awesome book title, in my opinion. But he says this, uh, for start, the Greek word for sin is missing the mark. So if you're not hitting the mark, if you're not living perfectly in God's will, we're all missing the mark. That's called sin. So it's not that it's trying to be a negative word. It's just saying, hey, guess what? You're not quite reaching where God would have you reach. And we all know that we fail miserably around different parts of our lives like that. We desire to be there, but it's, it's an ongoing journey. But Budjeski says this, he says that there's actually, there are seven steps towards, um, to, to set the seven layers or steps in sin. It's a little bit like walking from the light of the ground floor down into the darkness of the basement. Let's break open those seven steps really very, very briefly. He says this, he says that we all lie in somewhere or other. And the more we lie, the more we have to lie. But there's a solution. We can ah, we can repent. Go to the confessional, sit before God in our private prayer and say, I got it wrong, I'm sorry. And we step back into living the mark where we should be. But if we fail to repent of the fact that we lied in somewhere or other, we find ourselves going to step number two, which is self-protection. Each lie needs a new protective layer, just like layers of onions, an onion does. Our lies need bodyguards. So we step aside even more from truth and hitting the mark. We have a choice. We go, oh gosh, my conscience is burning. Time for the confessional. Time to say sorry to myself, to others, whoever it might be. But often we don't do that. We take another step down towards the dark, dank, musty basement habituation. Where we lied out of need, now we learn to lie without needing to. We've gone from lying to actually becoming a liar and thinking it's okay to lie like we lie. Again, we can repent. Often people don't. We self-deceive. We lose track of our own, um, of, of the truth itself. So to relieve discomfort, we start believing our own lies and thinking our lies are actually true. Oh, well, it, you know, um, people are late, so I was okay turning up late, because everybody turns up late. Rather than thinking, actually, no, I was wrong. I should have left home earlier. I could have left home earlier. It's my fault. It's, you know, I need to own up. I've got to fess up to this. If we don't repent and fess up, we end up going towards rationalization. Notice we're starting where we lived in the light, the dark words there are starting to become the darkness with barely being able to read the words. Rationalization, I grasp on the truth, weakens, we blame truth. Truth is what we let each other get away with. 
So I let you lie and you let me lie and neither of us challenge each other at all. We just get away with it. If that happens, then te- lying becomes a craft. No one could believe we could tell so many lies or such big ones. <laughs> Think politics. <laughs> but it's interesting in this place because this is where the whistleblowers start to speak and say, hang on a minute, we've got a problem here, we've got a problem. And a whole group will turn and say, they're the one that's wrong. Jesus had this experience with the Pharisees, the Sadducees and the scribes and other people as well. They wanted to find any way to say this man is wrong because basically they were turning their own duty upside down. Once lying is accepted rather than condemned, it becomes required, not just as individuals or even as a family or even as a church community or a town or a state, but even as a nation and worse so globally. The whole world begins to start taking on a lie that, well, there are too many people we need to abort some of them. Oh, well, there's all, you know, um, uh, you think of it. We know there's lots of examples like that. This is where we are. To some extent, this is what we're becoming. The solution to this missing the mark is that we would repent and believe. The challenge, though, is, is literally we're not just bound up by our, our original sin. It's like there's three ropes, the three different types of sin that are, that are wrapping us all up and tying us. And each of them seems to have seven levels like those seven steps like seven strands here within each piece of those ropes and every strand has a power over us and every one of those powers has got to be broken which is why I taught you about being able to deal with all those different words all those lines in my life I had to deal with every strand and have myself see myself cut free and there are those three strands working together let's take a look at generational ancestral sin even our heroes in the bible succumbed to generational and ancestral sin Really quick example, Abram, Genesis 12, he takes his wife Sarai into into Egypt and there Pharaoh sees Sarai and says, what a beautiful woman. He goes, oh, it's my sister. It's not, it's his wife. (laughs) He lies to Pharaoh and Pharaoh says, oh, come with me, dear sister, you know, come and be with me. Once she's been with Pharaoh, all hell lets loose and he discovers this is Abram's wife. So they're ejected from Egypt. Does Abram tell his son Isaac about this? I don't know that he does. Abram, I mean, Isaac makes exactly the same mistake with his wife, Rebecca. Only they go towards, I um, can't think where it is, but this King Abelibelibelibelibelibelibelibelibelibelibelibelibelibelibelibelibelibelibelibelibelibelibelibelibelibelibelibelibelibelibelibelibelibelibelibelibelibelibelibelibelibelibelibelibelibelibelibelibelib
Roll on towards 1815, around that time when the Industrial Revolution kicked in, we see life begin to speed up and the family begins to break down. And we start having newspapers which do report what's going on. It's called facts, not like today's stuff, which is an opinion or what we want you to think you should believe. But what we begin to see is the only other written word in many ways that's beginning to seriously affect people's lives is somebody else's written word in their lives, not the word of God. People are no longer basing everything on the word of God. Go to the 1900s, you've got look, the world's moving more quickly, the family's starting to part a lot more, you've got World War I happens. You've got thousands upon thousands of dads that go to war, bang, they never come back. Remember those cycles of development and the importance of dad protecting mum? and particularly the importance of him moulding that teenager through those teenage years, suddenly you've got thousands of dads that never come home. And if they did come home, their hearts were so um, battle-worn and weary, they couldn't work from an emotional perspective anyway. Therefore, they, could, they failed to really deeply affirm their own sons as well. It was during that time, it's actually in 1930, that the Anglican Church turned around the first um, body of Christendom in the world that said it's okay to have contraception. This is the first knife in marriage, is contraception itself. Because it basically says marriage doesn't have to be about procreation and about children, whereas there'd always been that openness to life beforehand. 1925 to 50, we see thousands more dads going off to war, bang, getting killed and never coming back. And these are the boys in some ways who haven't necessarily been strongly fathered by their dads. We also see women in military uniform, not on the front line, but the first time we see extensive numbers of women away from the home having to serve war. Their own role is beginning to change. We have radio, so where at least you could talk to somebody because there was no other noise in the room. Well, there might have been the gramophone somewhere at some point or other, but suddenly the radio is there. We've got another opinions and different things affecting the fact even our basic communication of looking each other in the eyes and engaging with each other is beginning to be diluted because the radio is there. There's no wonder by 1950 to 1975, for the first time in history, we see the gay rights movement kicking in. Why didn't that happen in 1850 or 1800? History speaks to us very clearly. We've got men saying, no, thank you, we'll, ha we'll have each other. We've got women saying, well, burn our bras, we don't need men. Thank you very much as well. TV begins to come in. No longer have we just got noise in the room, but we don't even look at each other while that noise is on. We're all now looking at the screen that's giving us all of our propaganda. 1975 to 2000, what happens after the sexual revolution? Abortion comes in, no fault divorce, decriminalization of sodomy. And suddenly we've got another screen we can look at on our own. But you've got to share it sometimes because it's a computer. But few, then we get iPads and laptops and all the rest of it. By the year 2000, no wonder today we live in a place of pansexuality, pornography, a virtual world, same sex, yes, I can spend mar spell marriage, but mirage. Because what's happened is we've actually, not, that is the last knife into the other aspect of marriage. Stick it in the heart, stick it in the back. Then marriage dies. The unity of procreative aspects of the marriage are being under attack. We have transgenderism and the whole male, female thing almost doesn't exist. Because what's happened is slowly but surely, and these are my own figures incidentally, we've come to a place where for many people they've got no idea what man or woman or masculine or feminine really is at all. They're deeply, deeply confused. So we see there that society sinned and rejected the divine and didn't repent. It self-protected itself from its sinfulness by running and getting busy and do, 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 rather than knowing to be with I am. Habituated in its previous bad decisions, it deceived that what it was doing was right. It realized near the war this wasn't, wasn't gonna work, it still went on. It rationalized about its own human insight and it rejected divine insight. It lied to itself and everybody else and now duty of care has been totally turned upside down. If that's how we've got to where we are, then we ask ourselves, whereabouts are we going? And then we're coming to land. I might have a few questions. A book written in the late 80s, when I was still in the gay community, called After the Ball, was written by two Harvard graduates, a, uh, psych, um, a psychology major and a marketing major uh, called Kirk and Masden. Uh, they admitted that they're talking about propaganda when they were talking about how America will conquer its fear and hatred of gays in the 1990s. And I was part and parcel of some of these strategic discussions in London when I was in the gay community. And putting the book very, very bluntly, basically we were saying this, we need to infiltrate and to take leadership in seven particular areas in society. Entertainment, not difficult. 
the gay guy is the cool guy on TV today. The straight woman is just trying to keep everything together. And the straight guy is he's, he's the dumb one, you know? If you look at comedy, that's what it's all about. The media, we have to affect the media. You know, everything's got to be okay, gay, gay, okay, okay, gay, you know? Education. Safe schools, I think I've said enough. The military. Healthcare, particularly psychology, psychotherapy and psychiatry whereby we change the diagnostic to statistic manual and we get all the top leading psychiatrists and psychologists who are gay saying people are born this way, they don't need to change, nothing wrong with them, it's all fine. How dare you turn around and question somebody in that space and place. Politics speaks for itself. And the last bastion we knew, or the last hurdle we knew would have to fall was going to be sport. Why? Because to do sport you have to have a body. And what does your body show? That you're a man. And yours, you're a woman. And mine, I'm a man. Our body shows that. So the more we can cut up the body and change the body, etc., we get rid of male and female, which means we get rid of, from the beginning, male and female, he created them, which means our genesis means nothing, which means God means nothing, which means father and mother means nothing, which means Jesus came that we know the father. Well, that means nothing. Even G Joseph and Mary are still in our nativity sets, but if we're not careful, there won't be a father and a mother in our nativity sets anymore because that will vilify, offend or insult somebody in the future. I love this picture. Just want to show it to you quickly. Do you get it? I think so. In real life, the guy on the right is trying to attack the guy on the left, but on TV, it makes it look like the guy on the left is trying to attack the guy on the right. Duty turned upside down. I don't want to show this to you really. This is one of the top selling gay um, porn movies in 2014. So while the Catholic Church is internationally trying to deal with child sex abuse, we have got Icon Mail, which is the gay uh, porn company producing films like Forgive Me Father. Um, oh, then there's something called Scandal in the Vatican. This is 2015's best, one of its best selling gay movies as well. And we've seen pictures of Pope Francis in some of those scenes as well. Just so you're aware that when we're told that we're homophobic for daring to even question anything to the LGBT lot, they are ridiculing us to the nth degree. This is something on the shelf in my local library, where all the teenage kids are. One of the forthright things there in the front, it was called Make the Yuletide Gay. It's about sweet-natured gun climbing back into the closet to survive the holiday with his wacky parents. His parents are clearly the problem. And Cutie Pie Nathan's preparing to spend another Christmas with his cold-hearted relatives. They are clearly the problem. Make the Yuletide gays a Christmas treat you'll want to savour many times over. So I'm seeing all the teenage kids going to the latest movies and what they're going to watch at home. Interesting website, The Rise of Non-Monogamy. Let's look at the bottom bit particularly. Non-monogamy means having more than one sexual or romantic relationship. Cheating is a kind of non-monogamy, but this is about ethical non-monogamy. So many kinds of non-monogamy, an open relationship or sex with other people, a couple exchange partners for one or more nights, a threesome or a group sex. Polyamorous have multiple relationships. Poly V is when one person dates two people. In a triad, you've got three people all dating each other. Or you might have a quad where you've got four people all dating each other, all sleeping with each other, etc. They may have a primary partner, the person you live with, but a secondary partner might be somebody that you see occasionally. There might be rules about safer sex, staying overnight. Find out what works for you. Let me tell you, this is the code of the gay community without a question of doubt. It really, <coughs> really is. Non-monogamy is about choices, more sex, different kind of sex, kink, exploring a different role, attracted to more than one gender, falling for more than one person at the same time, variety, sorting out your boredom, doing sex work, enjoying group sex, or like the sense, the sense of freedom and autonomy. Because we know that these things do not lead people to freedom and autonomy. It's important we're told, our young people are being told, to think about what you want from your relationships. It might not be the same as what you think you're supposed to want. Polyamority is very much already here. That's the P in the LGBTQQIAAP. There's plus two S on the end as well. The plus is for those that are missed off and the two S is in case you have two spirits. You might have your Aboriginal or your indigenous spirit, you might have your contemporary spirit, which means you can now get married to yourself. And yes, there are websites where people are starting to say, we'd like to marry ourselves. Because it's discrimination not to let somebody be able to get married. This is just out just earlier this year, February, incest and necrophilia should be legal, with some of the young people in Sweden begin to say to us. Because if you can leave your body for, for medical research, why can't you leave your body so somebody can have sex with you once you're dead? I know it's gross, 
but this is the stuff. The German Ethics Council is saying we can't have a taboo like incest anymore. We've got to get rid of this. It's, it's not fair to people to say that being, having incest is taboo. We're beginning to see the disintegration of any type of moral sexuality. I believe the church's mission is several fold. We do need that, that our bishops and our clergy are really informed and engaging, particularly on the topic of child sexual abuse, because underneath so much of this stuff is childhood sexual abuse. And to some extent, all of our kids today are being sexually abused really directly through pornography and through marketing. Because the stuff I was seeing that harmed me, I'm seeing the kids being exposed to this today thinking if it had that effect on my life, what effect is it having on them? Because the stuff I saw was nothing, if you like, compared to what they're seeing today. We need a robust education around this, especially for teens and youth. And to understand inner healing. A third of Christ's ministry was healing people. Proclaiming and witnessing to, charity, to chastity and charity. An urgent engagement into the sexual ethics forum as well. There are some health risks to um, same-sex practice that are never talked about. Incredible amounts of promiscuity. It's not uncommon for a gay guy to have between uh, 100 or 1,000 partners. Some guys I know have had over 2,000 sexual partners. I know you think, how do you fit them all in? Well, if you go to an orgy on a Friday night, you can fit a few in. Physical health, there's diseases that are un unheard of in the, in the heterosexual population that exist in the homosexual population. I've talked to some serious top gastroenterologists here in, uh, uh, in Australia, and, uh, and some of them are now having to ask clients whether or not they're practicing uh, male homosexuals. And I said, why would you ask them that question? He said, I have to see them late in the afternoon because I can't sterilize my equipment quickly enough between, between the different clients. He said, patients, he said, because the, 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 um, the pathogens are so virulent. Nobody's telling the gay community this. Mental health, psychiatric illnesses, drug abuse, depression, suicide attempts. Well, you can imagine why I might be feeling all of those by the time I hit 17 and came out and said, I'm gay. People says, oh, yes, you are. Well done. That's OK. We all accept you. <laughs> Nobody stopped to say, what's really happening in your life, James? What's really been going on for you? Let's look at this. Being blunt with you, when you stick the penis into one of two different orifices, particularly when one man does it to another man, or as men are doing it to women today as well, it affects the immune system of the body and it begins to break it down. We're seeing a massive rise in oral cancers, anal cancers, um, particularly in the 15 to 24 year old age group. Why? Because they're having the stuff thrown at them in pornography and they're, to they're told to go and get on with it. It's part of who you are. Try out your two virginities, a safe school says, etc. And they're beginning to do this stuff and it's affecting their lives. And nobody's saying to them in the name of freedom, this is slowly killing you. Monogamy in the gay community. 66% of people have sex outside of their relationship in the first year. With around 90%, that's a conservative number, having sex outside the relationship after five years. The, uh, the um, gay couples research from San Francisco shows it's 100%. I'd like to say this to you. Cool as it is, the vagina has 27 layers of muscle to it and the lubricative agent means it's, it's created for penetration and it's created for childbirth. The anal passage is basically a thin layer of tissue. It's like a piece of glad wrap, okay? Toxicity, feces inside that, around that, the blood, the life-giving cycle of, of the body. If you pierce that piece of glad wrap easily, it wouldn't be too difficult to do that. The feces, the toxicity begins to enter the bloodstream. And that's why we have a problem. All these tiny tears are happening. And people think this is called sex. No, it's not. It's called genital activity that's profoundly destructive and actually leads you to an early death. The, the ejaculate, the, the male ejaculate is meant for one place. It's meant for within the vagina. It's there, it's able to deal with that and all the different agents within there. If it goes into other parts of the body, it begins to affect the body. Promiscuity we're seeing are reaching, are reaching the levels of the 70s. Um, uh, a young man's got a great chance today, a very strong chance of being HIV uh, within, by the time he hits 55. And super gonorrhea's hit Australia. Just so you know, super gonorrhea, there's no antibiotics to help to, to cure that. But nobody's telling our young people that. And nobody's telling the gay community that as well. So many people today are being infected with super gonorrhea. Is this a, a lifestyle to take on? Or is this a death style to take on? I believe it's a death style. And I know that from first-hand experience as well. I mentioned about the cancers in 2007, nearly 10 years ago, people who had at least six oral sex partners during their lifetime were nearly three and a half times more likely of developing throat cancer.
that information is not being passed out to general society and it's not being passed out particularly to our young people. This year, Cancer Research UK, anal cancer incidence rates have increased since the late, 19, late 1970s in Britain by 130%. I wonder why. Pornography. We know there's a massive issue with pornography. I'm going to sweep through that because we know that pornography is just, it's one of the biggest battlegrounds. Until we start getting a, a national filter on this stuff, we're going to keep having constant problems. Same-sex marriage, quickly. There's two things that, 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 um, that the, the push is for, to redefine marriage itself. So they're saying, you know, it's just two people of the same sex want to get married. It's not going to change anything. Yes, it is. It's going to change everything, actually. Whoops, that's jumping very quickly. Redefine marriage to any two people getting married. Can you think of who any two people could be? Mother and son, brother and sister, grandfather, granddaughter. If any two people should get married, why shouldn't, the, why shouldn't we say yes to polygamy for the Muslim community as well? Because we're changing the definition of marriage after all. That's one thing. The second thing is around that, you have to create anti-discrimination laws. Otherwise you have a gay couple who are married and somebody says, well, I don't think that's marriage. Well, they might get hurt by that. That's called vilifying, offending or insulting someone. So you have to create a law, whoops, I'm sorry, whereby you can't discriminate against somebody's sexual orientation or their gender identity. This is why Archbishop Porteous had the problem he had by producing a Catholic document and giving it to children in a Catholic school where people had signed up to a Catholic ethos. The state law said, oh, you're discriminating. We know, fortunately, that's been dropped, that case. But nevertheless, across the world, we're seeing hundreds of cases of this type. Anti-discrimination law therefore protects all these different kinds of sudden, the sudden rise of gender identities. Now, Facebook told us in February that there were 56 types of gender identity and that there are five types of sexual orientation, heterosexual, homosexual, lesbian, transsexual, bisexual. And there are two types of marriage. But if you take all those figures together and you multiply them by each other, there are all the different types of marriage you could have. You could end up with 3,721 different types of family. And that would have to be taught, recognised and supported in our schools as well, because that would now suddenly become the norm in our land as well. The thing is this, is since February, these lists of orientations and, and uh, genders have moved on. So we now say where there were five orientations, we're now told there's 70 types of orientation and six types of attraction that you can connect to those orientations. So you could have 420 different types of sexual orientation. The gender list is now gone from being 56 to 112. I've actually seen a list of 340, which means you can almost try out a different gender every day of the year if you want to. Remember I talked before about those layers of shame and the wrong identity that I was taking on about myself. Think about it if a child ends up trying, trying out all these different things. Maybe I'm ambigender or maybe I'm autogender or maybe I'm aerogender and they're trying out all these different things. They're moving further and further and further away from in the beginning, male and female, he created them. The pronoun list. Today we have he, she and they. If you read in the London Times yesterday, Oxford University is now getting rid of he and she, and they're going for Z. But then there's, if you meet someone, you may need to say to them, what are your pronouns? Because let's be honest, if you offend somebody, you can get into trouble. We'll come back to that in a minute. So where's Australia gonna go to if we say yes to same-sex mirage, which is what it is? We're told nothing will change, but the consequences we see from Canada, within the UK, parts of the US, even parts of Ireland, we're seeing that people are losing freedom. We can talk now and say, I don't agree with same-sex marriage, but let me tell you, if it gets passed, the first person that will be done for anti-discrimination is me. <laughs> come and visit me in prison, I'd like to see you there. Well, not I'd like to see you there, I'd like to just, just come and visit me there. <laughs> At the moment, there's room for discussion and debate, although homophobia phobia is being pushed upon us. That means we make you deeply frightened of you being called a homophobe, so therefore you don't speak up because you don't want to offend somebody. And yet deep, deep down, the majority of our country feel deeply uncomfortable with this. They're saying, look, I've got my gay nephew, my gay son, my gay brother, whoever it is. You know, we all know somebody whom we dearly love. Of course we love them. Of course we do. We don't always think that their life is necessarily in a good place, but they may not think the same about us as well. And we've all got a judgment on that. So be it. We're happy to some extent with Mardi Gras, but we don't want all, we don't want marriage itself to be totally changed just because one or 2% of the country or rather a minority 
and that 2% of the country wants to see it change because it fits their political and their gender ideology. Trade suppliers will be forced to have pink ticks. We've heard of photographers, we've heard of florists, we've heard of wedding venues, other people all being in trouble for all sorts of different reasons. I've got pages of, of examples of this. Conscience, we'll be told you can't think that a man and woman is marriage anymore because that's not the law of the land. Mum and dad will no longer be protected. And in ACT, um, uh, birth certificates are parent one and parent two. The same is true here in New South Wales. People are having to now ask for mother and father to be on their birth certificates. In ACT, you can actually change your gender uh, for, without surgery or hormones or anything else. So, sir, if you decide tomorrow that you think you might be a lady, you can say, I'd like to change my birth certificate to female. Or you could be neutral, but you can only change it once a year. OK, just to warn you. That's law in our land today in Australia. Don't tell me this isn't already happening. Um, religious practice. We will not be able to act necessarily according to our beliefs. Exceptions for religions deliberately are being deliberately fought against by 30 Australian organisations. They're saying there should be no exemptions for any religions on any of this stuff. And if there are to be exemptions, there to be draconian exemptions. Well, what happens to dr draconian exemptions? Eventually they become exemptions full stop. It just happens. And basically, if it's offensive for you to turn around and say to these two men, well, you're not married, or the church wouldn't say you're married, etc., well, they can sue you. There's a gentleman called Gary who's sued many a person here in, uh, in uh, New South Wales. I think he's made nearly half a million dollars out of it up to now, deliberately targeting Christian places to have a go at them to make money. And of course, what happens is people don't want to spend thousands and hundreds of thousands on lawyers and publicity. They'd rather just give the money. Belief. You can't discover, dis discuss differing opinions. We become a totalitarian regime. There's a way to think. There's a way you're told to think. Privacy. Can't, you can't say what you think. Democracy is not just limited to political parties, but policies and referendum. Remembering our soldiers died that we would have a democracy in this land. A freedom to be able to have differences of opinion and to disagree and to agree as well. And gender, basically, will, it will be implicitly discriminatory for schools and clubs to provide gender specific facilities. So Canadian Catholic schools have to have a, a gay straight or a queer straight alliance there in their schools because that is the national law of the land itself what would happen for us here in Australia. Just a few pictures of some of the things that are going on in the world. In Massachusetts, three women have got married, Kitty, Dolly and Bryn. And dear Kitty here, she's had a baby. She had a baby last summer. Oh, God bless. <gasps> These two now want to have a baby each then they can have their perfect family. Oh, then we've got our first thruple. A gay trio in Thailand got married recently. These three guys got married to each other. Um, here we have um, two, two guys who, isn't this lovely? They've got their own baby at last. Notice who's missing from the picture almost? Mother. Ladies, how do you feel about the fact this baby's being ripped away from its mother at birth? That's what I experienced. I deal with many adoptees who live with the pain of being ripped away from mum and dad. And you think same-sex marriage, I say to people, you think same-sex marriage is a good idea with this? Because you say yes to marriage, you've got to say yes to parents and family and the rest of it. These two men, the Spanish men with their, their, their twin girls and the smiling doctors in the background, there's no woman at all in this picture. Most gay men have a real issue with misogyny. They have a difficulty dealing and relating to the, uh, the seriously, the emotional world of a woman. Who's going to grow up with these girls? Who's going to these, say to these girls, you are good just because you are. Who you are is good because of who you are. All we talked about mother earlier, we're missing from these two little girls' lives. You might have heard of The Gender Fairy, which is a book in many of our kindergartens, in kindy and pre-primary school. And the message is, those naughty doctors, how dare they tell you? that you're a boy or a girl, because only you know whether you're a boy or a girl, and no one can tell you. This book is being read now in our state school primary schools, in pre-primary and year one. A couple of posters from safe schools. Everyone should be able to wear the uniform, makes them comfortable. No one should be made to feel uneasy, especially when they're at school. Gross. Being straight is just a phase. This is a picture, a poster up in the schools in Victoria. Now, much of the safe school stuff has been watered down and diluted deliberately by uh, the federal government. Victoria said, no, this is our state government, this is what we want. Um, just to let you know about this stuff. Bruce Jenner, Caitlyn Jenner, celebrated the great trans person. We rarely hear the stories, as you do on the front page of the British press, about people who've had these operations and say, actually, I want to change back. I've met with many people who've had their bodies um, Mutilated, really. 
penis is cut off, breasts cut off, to realise this wasn't the issue, that, wasn't the, that that wasn't the problem. The problem was something deeply psychological inside, which is why I share my story with you today, as I did. Now, I said earlier, there's a, if you get someone's pronouns wrong, if you get someone's gender pronouns wrong too often in New York, you can be fined up to a quarter of a million dollars. In Canada, you can be imprisoned for up to two years for getting somebody's gender pronouns wrong. Go and look it up. Safe Schools embraces all forms of sexual expression and activity at any age. We say yes to same-sex marriage. We say yes to all forms of gender sexual promotion. People don't realise, people are like, ugh, safe schools. But same-sex same -sex marriage is great. I'm like, you don't understand. They're one of the same agenda from different angles. You've got to understand that. And we've got to educate ourselves and other people about that as well. There's already healthy, enviable diversity and inclusion in Australia today. We're known for being multi-ethnic, which is big, different from being multicultural. Equality is not about uniformity and sameness. It's about being able to celebrate our difference. And the law already offers equal rights across the board for same-sex attracted couples and other sex, other sex attracted couples. 85 changes were made, sorry, laws were, changes were made to 85 laws in 2008 in this country. So that bedside laws, if somebody's ill or dying, tax breaks, the whole lot, it's all the same. The same sex couples and other sex attracted couples, people don't realise that. We're told it's all inequality, inequality, inequality. No, it's not. It's like we want marriage so that we can destroy it because we can't have the joy and the mystery that men and women have between themselves. Australian marriage equality tell us that all love is equal. I think I proved to you tonight, all love is not equal. If you don't get these places healthily, then these areas, your peer relationships are eroticised and even your family relationships and those around you can end up becoming eroticised as well. And we begin to see that, this whole incest thing and, and, and pornography and the rest of it. And when you take agape out of there, the light is gone to shed God's light into the midst of all that's been going on around you as well. There's no difference in marriage. Well, I sat down with some of my mates um, who, like myself, have practiced homosexually and who are now married as well. And we came up with this, the difference between our long-term same, same sex attracted relationships and our long term other attracted relationships, same sex, sorry, our other attracted, other sex attracted relationships, um, mostly monogamous among heterosexual people for a lifetime, privately erotic, anything that erotic expression is in private, you're other centered, a satiable mystery. You know, men, we never understand women, women, you never understand men, but there's something quite satisfying in the midst of that. You become a piece of that as well. We're shamed if we don't live up to being the best we can be. Uh, our extremes are softened. You know, guys are very visual, very physical, the rest of it, and women are much more emotional, and, and we, we, we kind of brush off against each other a little bit there. Few medical issues when it comes to sexual expression, if any, and the four loves have the opportunity to be expressed, particularly through parenting with children, etc. as well. For same-sex attracted, deep down it's emotional monogamy. Relationships can be very short-lived. Um, the eroticization, it can be very, very, very public. There's lots of, and everything to do with the gay community is very erotic. It's about me and what I get to a greater or lesser extent. Um, it's an insatiable mystery. You've got two guys trying to find the true masculine in each other and neither of them's really got it. Because if a guy's really got the masculine, he doesn't have sex with the guy. Almost glory and shame, you know? Increased anxiety due to the imbalance, the incompleteness of that relationship. Numerous medical issues. And only certain degrees of love can be understood and experienced. It's actually it's horrible to say to somebody you can have marriage when they can't really have marriage. And I'd say this to you, you go and celebrate a wedding between a man and a woman, there's a true reflection of eternity. It's a twisted reflection of eternity for two men. New lives, new lives come naturally, the possibility of being secure in your sexual identity if you like. New lives come through assistance. And if you've got two dads with a girl, that little girl can't be balanced in her, in her sexual identity. Healthy balance setting for kids, imbalance setting. Long-term social stability, questionable social stability. Greater life expectancy, shorter life expectancy. Few, if any, medical issues, numerous ones. Limited exposure to pathogens, a high risk of pathogen exposure. An opening of new aspects in kids and showing you new ways of different things. A closing of new aspects. It's just not there because often you're trying to solve the stuff in your own self. We're told more people will commit suicide. Research shows us from Denmark, to, to do with uh, uh, um, uh, looking at Denmark, who've had um, commitments to same-sex couples for longer than anybody else in the world, that actually you're eight times 
more likely to commit suicide if you enter into a long-term same-sex relationship than you are to enter into a heterosexual relationship. And Sweden came up with a quite a similar number. Whether it's 2.7 or 8, it's still you're at much greater risk from that. My own cousin entered into his long-term um, same-sex partnership some 10 years ago. That's when same-sex civil unions, it wasn't a marriage as the UK has now. But he entered into that, they had the photographer, the matching suits, the cake, the photo it, it was the same as a wedding day, basically. Three months later, he took his own life with a drug overdose. The promise is that this thing out there was going to solve all the stuff inside here. And when he got there, all that happened now is he was legally bound to this man who himself was imperfect and was ready to strip him of everything, all of his assets and everything. He couldn't, he couldn't deal with it. The easiest thing was just to go, we see a high rate of suicide here, but nobody's talking about that because it's not about just about changing marriage. Deep down, it is about gender ideology. Nothing will change, we're told. I went through and mentioned some of those things to you already. They're just eight things that could well and truly happen. If we really care, particularly if we really care about kids, we have to say no to same-sex marriage. We just have to. And also, it's actually a long-term justice to same -se people in same-sex attraction to say to them, look, guys, we can't hoodwink you into thinking you can have something you, haven't, you can't have. I believe it's like turning around and looking at the ocean. If you're the beach and there you've got the ocean, the ocean goes, hi, beach, and the beach goes, hi, ocean. They're completely different, but they kind of fit together, a bit like male and female. The river is a big expanse of water. It looks like the ocean to some extent, but it's got two banks. The banks speak to each other and the rest of it. Two same things speaking in the midst of that area. A river is not an ocean. An ocean is not an estuary. You can't turn around and suddenly say that marriage is two men and two women. Marriage is only a man and a woman. If you want to find another word, I say to people, find it, but don't take the word marriage. And stop affecting marriage. But actually it is about being able to dilute and destroy the male and the female. I just want to encourage you that recently, just a few months ago in the Melbourne Herald Sun, a question was given to the general public, should transgender awareness be taught in primary schools? 86% said no. The following question was, should same-sex marriage be legalised? 64% said no. And we suddenly discover that the LGBTI group and Labour and others say, oh, we don't really want a plebiscite because the Australian public can't be trusted to make a decision on such an important matter as this. Can you see how the belittling and the pushing us away and not letting our consciousness be alive is already beginning to happen. Look, if the Liberals are doing it, I'd be having a go at them. The Greens are as bad as, as Labour to some extent at the moment. I just wanted to show you this really quickly because this was the gay manifesto from 1987. I thought this was tongue in cheek when I first read it. I was in the gay community in 87. We shall sodomise your sons, seduce them in your schools, dormitories, gymnasiums, locker rooms, sports arenas, seminaries, youth groups, movie theatre bathrooms, army bunk houses, all male clubs, house of congress, wherever men are men together. Your sons shall become our minions and do our bidding. They will be, they'll be recast in our image. They will come to crave and adore us. Legislation shall be passed which engenders love between men. Love between men will be fashionable and de rigueur, will eliminate heterosexual liaisons. Churches who condemn us will be closed. We are to be free to live our lives according to the dictates of the pure imagination. For us, too much is not enough. 30 years ago, we were saying that homosexuality is to be superior. I met with somebody today who said, out of a group of six guys, five of them have just come out recently. Five. She said, I've got no idea about any of them, she said. The woman Mary is to be crushed, she's to become an incubator or a breeder, rather than be the one that crushes the head of the serpent. And it's interesting, people say Jesus said nothing about homosexuality, and he said, one of the shortest verses in the Gospels is, remember Lot's wife. She turned and dared to look back at something that was atrocious to God. Some communist goals for you from 1963, again, really quickly because of time. Get control of schools, soften the curriculum, the party line in textbooks, control teachers associations, control student newspapers and the press, key positions in radio, TV, movies, eliminate all laws governing obscenity. Um, promote pornography and obscenity in books, magazines, etc. Present homosexuality, gen degeneracy and promiscuity as normal, natural and healthy. Discredit the Bible. Eliminate prayer, any phase of religious expression in schools. Control more unions, big business. Dominate the psychiatric profession. Discredit the family. Encourage promiscuity, easy divorce. Raise children away from the negative influence of parents. Ros Ward, say schools advocate has said that safe schools as a communist she says 
It's not an anti-bullying program, but a means to promote sexual and gender diversity. And the, the length, the leeway she's been given is huge. The question I was going to ask is, are Daniel Andrews and Ros Ward related? Because they look like a lot like each other. They, they do look like a lot like each other. And I'm sure that, well, they're possessed by the same spirit, I'm sure. I'm not saying which spirit it is. I want to go to some of our key responses in this as well. People say marriage is about equality. It means inequality for our kids. Love doesn't discriminate. Well, stop discriminating against kids and their own love needs as well. Well, love is love. Well, it's not loving to separate a mother from her baby. And if two, then why not three, four or more people in marriage? And actually there are four types of love, not just one love. So all love is not equal as well. Gay marriage will strengthen the institution. If it's gay marriage, then group marriage, that's not actually strengthening marriage as an institution itself. Gay marriage won't affect your family, we're told. Well, it means gay sex education and it takes husband and wife away from the Marriage Act. That affects our families. Of course it does. Or is, it's just not fair. Well, why should around 1% change marriage for the rest of the community? Marriage equality breeds inequality as differences of opinion become illegal. I said to you I'm a work in progress, but I want to leave you with this last thought. God's unfailing love, as I hope you've heard in my story, is our hope. I'm still a work in progress, but I'm enjoying the journey and I'm really looking forward to what God's got on next. And yes, it's like a roller coaster sometimes, but my mind and your minds are to be sober and ready for action. And we're to put all of our hope in the unconditional love brought to us by the revelation of the person of Jesus Christ. As I said to you, this isn't just my story, but the story of many, many other people too. And it's not even about religion, politics, but actually overall, it is about objective truth. And there is such a thing as objective truth. There's a person who is truth, Jesus Christ. We need more vulnerability. We need more dialogue, more witness, more deep and non-eroticized same-sex friendships in our world. It's a very real battle. The journey is long, but the reward is great. And I think that we all, including our brothers and sisters in the LGBTQQIAAP plus 2S community, they too also deserve better. Thank you for listening.